There we go. Uh, Rob, you can hear me, right? Yes. Hi, Windsor. Hi, Windsor Tang cool. Vascular Surgery. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Rana Day, who is from Hi. Interventional Radiology, and Dr. Blue. <laughs> So, uh, Rob, can you tell us the story of the yeah. history of this patient? Sure. So I just have a few slides. Um, so this is a case for venogram, IVUS, and likely venoplasty and stenting. Uh, next slide. So this is a 69-year-old male who presented um, with a history of venous insufficiency in the past. Um, in 2011, he was treated with the, on the right with uh, greater saphenous vein ablation, and uh, then on the left in 2007, sorry, prior to that. Um, no other significant history, um, but now, next slide. Now he's uh, presenting with recurrent varicose veins, um, primarily in the right medial calf, um, also in the posterior calf. He also has some uh, swelling, generalized swelling of the right lower extremity. Um, it's one plus edema. No venous stasis, dermatitis, no ulceration. So Rob, this, this is a fairly common scenario uh, of patient who we have vein standard. So this patient had previous uh, laser ablation in the past. He came back with uh, recurrent and, and or persistent of his symptoms. Uh, the reason why we decide to vein stand this patient or take a look is, is he has some varicose veins in his legs, but it's not all that severe. And I didn't think the varicose veins alone can explain the amount of edema that he has in the left leg and, and the symptom that he, that he has. So we already gotten access in this patient. Uh, we access, uh, we put a, uh, we start with nine front sheath in, in the right common femoral vein and the left common femoral vein. So there are several different ways you can access this patient. You, you can certainly go through the femoral vein. He's overdriving. Uh, the common femoral vein, it's a, it's a good location. You can also access from the poppy two vein. Uh, and each of these access sites have different downsides and, and advantages. So, uh, so we did a venogram on this patient already. So uh, Rob can show us the, the venogram on, on this patient. He's speaking too loud. Uh, so you can see here, we just flushed from nine French sheaths bilaterally, and um, you can see fairly swift flow into the IVC. Uh, but you do see these uh, prominent veins on the right side, these collateral vessels uh, in the region of the right internal iliac vein. So this is a pretty common finding during venogram that you don't actually see the stenosis, but you see indirect uh, suggestions of stenosis, such as collateral, which we can see here in this case. We can see some pelvic collaterals. Uh, the veins look a little dilated. Uh, so on the venogram alone, it doesn't look all that bad. And we went on and do uh, IVUS in this patient. So Windsor, can you, can you share with us how you use venography versus intravascular ultrasound to make a determination on how you're going to treat these cases. I, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, Windsor has an extraordinarily busy uh, uh, lower extremity uh, you know, venous practice uh, here in, uh, in New York. And he, he's probably one of the busiest venous operators in the, in the, in the, in the area right now. But I, I think Windsor, for the, for the benefit of the audience, if you could just share with us what role you think right now in 2018 venography has and what role intravascular vascular ultrasound has? I think both of them are very important. They provide different kind of information. Uh, on venography, you cannot, you may not see the actual stenosis, but you can see the indirect suggestion of stenosis. And after having done many of these cases, it will give me a really good idea where the actual stenosis is. And it helped me to guide the IVIS uh, uh, imaging later on. The IVIS is, is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's it's 100% accurate in, in detecting the stenosis. And, and also, if the IVIS is very helpful, is that it helps you quantitate the severity of the stenosis, something that's much harder to do on, on venography. So do you, do you routinely perform intravascular ultrasound after you've performed saphenous vein ablation for your patients with leg edema and, 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 and leg swelling? Is that your sort of routine know. clinical protocol? No, that, but that's a great question. So if I do laser on a patient and he comes back to me and oh, says, okay. doctor, my varicose veins are gone, but my leg is still uncomfortable. What do you think is wrong? Is there something wrong with the laser procedure? 
I know that in that particular patient, it's very likely that he may have some additional pathology, such as uh, proximal venous outflow obstruction. So that's a patient I would do an MRI, and very likely would do <coughs> venography and IVIS to, to better characterize his, his iliac uh, anatomy. And so for, for this case that you have here right now, thank you for sharing that with us. Are you planning on doing intravascular ultrasound of one leg or on both legs? Oh, okay, so we, uh, we actually did both legs already. Okay. Uh, so because when we did a venography on this patient, both iliac veins look okay. So we looked at uh, the left side with IVIS and it appeared normal. We didn't see any significant stenosis. So now I'm gonna go do the IVIS, show you the IVIS on, on the right side. So this was uh, the IVUS that, uh, on, from the right iliac veins that we just did. So um, this is uh, the proximal external iliac, and we're coming down. So just for uh, clarification, uh, okay, so this is IVUS catheter. And this is the, uh, the external iliac vein right here. So we, we're coming down, and here we see a pretty severe, uh, I wouldn't say pretty severe, but that's definitely a stenosis here, right? Um, and now here it looks uh, a little better. Uh, in a, uh, this is a vena cava. So let's go back to the, ex so how do we quantitate the severity of the stenosis in the iliac vein? One way to do it is to measure the, the area of the, of the segment that we're interested in. So we're gonna go back to here. So, and then we're gonna do, go to draw. And then we're gonna map out the area of this area in question. We go around the, the, the vein. Okay, so we're gonna, oh, sorry. <laughs> Damn. That's one of those things that happen when you do a live case. Of course. Totally <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> okay, let's try again. We already previously measured up the, um, so here, the, the area of this segment of the external iliac vein is 45 millimeters square. In the external iliac, we like the area to be at least 100 millimeters square. So there, there's a stenosis here. But if you want to be sure, so we, uh, we can go to another area where we call the reference vessel. Let's find something. Let's try here, all right? So we're gonna measure the, uh, the area of this segment of the iliac vein. Okay, so this area of, of the vein is 124 millimeter square, so it's normal. So there's a 60, the eye was already calculated for us, there's about 63% stenosis here. So it's reasonable to, to stand this segment. And the, the, the other thing is that the presence of collateral suggests to me that this is, uh, this is, this is significant for the patient. I think after. So we're, gonna, um, so we're gonna go ahead and put the stent in the patient here. So we selected the war stent, and this is a very short segment stenosis, so, we, we, so, we, so we're gonna use the six centimeter stent. So Windsor, what's, what's your cutoff for area reduction? Um, how do you, do, are, are you using anything related to diameter measurements? Are you purely going by area reduction? How are you, how are you deciding whether to intervene? So Rob, most of the time, the stenosis, it's really severe. You don't even have to measure. But if you do have to measure, you're not sure whether it is significant stenosis, we like to see at least a 50% reduction in the area of, of the, uh, of the vein. And, and what size stent are you using here, and how did you come up with the determination of the size? So usually in the external iliac vein, I will put it in a 16 millimeter stent. But in this particular patient, the vein looks really big. Uh, we previously measure that it's, it's quite big in diameter, so we're gonna use a larger stent. We're gonna use an 18 times 60 millimeter stent in this particular patient. 
So Aki, Keith, Rahul, what, what size stents do you guys usually use? Do you purely go by IBIS or, or do, you, you know, do you have a, a, a default size that you usually use when you're doing these kinds of cases? I mean, I would say the most popular size is probably 16 millimeters, but if I have a really dilated <laughs> segment based on um, right. IBIS in the reference diameter, I, I, I could go 18 and even occasionally, although very rarely, 20, but I would say 16 is probably the number one size. And are you using IBIS for every single case? Yes, I, I, I do. I, I do. I, I think you'll miss, but I also like the point you made because I think that when you're injecting, and I would recommend actually you lateral injection, you really do get a good idea of uh, the flow um, in terms of filling collateral. So I, I like that and it's nice to see decompression when you're done. So I, I think I want to re emphasize that point. One of the advantages of venography is, is that it gives you an idea of the flow characteristics in the iliac veins, something that you cannot really see on IVIS. We're going to go ahead and deploy the stent. So the, the stent is in place. Uh, go ahead. Aki, are you using IVIS routinely for all of your, you know, deep vein uh, non-thrombotic cases? Absolutely. Uh, you know, IVIS has obviously the uh, diagnostic aspect of it, but also in terms of uh, determining where to land a stent, um, where the proximal part of it should end up, end up, and where the Did distal end? part should the end up. The patient is moving sure a little bit. That you're going from open to open. Okay. Uh, these are things that IVIS can help with tremendously, just technically speaking. So Windsor, do you want to, do you want to share with us, uh, you know, any uh, you know technical tips or or sort of words of wisdom about how to land the wall stent, which I think we we're, we're all um, intimately f familiar with. It's it's. Uh, possible pitfalls, even though it's the most commonly used device in, in North America right now, about how you land this accurately and, and right. how you make sure that it ends up where you, where, where you, where you want it to? So one of the features uh, of wall stents is that it will foreshorten as you deploy the stent and as you expand the stent with balloon angioplasty and it probably will do some further foreshortening <coughs> over a period of time. So it's very important to place the stent uh, in the right place. So how do I do that? I, I locate where I think is the most severe uh, segment of, of the iliac vein, and I center the stent right there. I'm making sure that I do not move the stent as I deploy it. Okay. okay. You good? Yep. Uh -huh. uh, what happened there? Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. so I think that looks about right. Yep, that looks about right. So I usually hold this in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're deploying the stand right now. This is an eight, as mentioned earlier, this is an 1860s stop right there. Okay. So before, before I commit myself, I want to take one final look. It looks pretty good. I'm going to pull the stand back just a little bit. Uh, floor on. Yep. So I just pulled the stand back about a centimeter, so okay, you can finish deploying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That looks perfect, Windsor. So the stent is, is, is deployed right now. It looks pretty well expanded, but I almost always will do uh, post stent dilatation just to make sure that this stent is fully uh, expanded. So let's take that out. So what size balloon are you planning on dilating this with then now uh, that you just put so it in an 18 millimeter stent? So this is an 18 millimeter stent, so I'm going to use the 18 millimeter balloon. Okay. So uh, we remove the sheet for the stent. So we're going to position the balloon in place. So Windsor, obviously, you know the the the, the IVIS showed that there was um, external compression, uh, you know, which we're going to talk about formally in a, in a, in, a, in a few minutes. But um, you know, how often do you see extrinsic compression on the external iliac vein when 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 you're doing these investigative cases? Is it is it is it common? Do you think this is underdiagnosed? What, what's the what's the relative proportion of, of of patients who are still symptomatic that you're finding this on? So uh, that's a great question. Let me answer it this way: uh, We see, I mean, we select our patient really well. So it's very unusual that we identify we bring a patient to the operating room and we find nothing. So uh, our, our accuracy in patient selection is close to 95 percent. 
So most of these patients have uh, external compression from the artery or from some other adjacent uh, organs or mass. What's very interesting in, in, in having done so many cases, I find that many of these patients also have intraluminal obstruction from a DVT in the past. And in fact, many of these patients do not know that they have a DVT in the past. So in at least some percentage of these patients, there is there are two types of uh, stenosis uh, happening. There is an external compression and there is an interluminal obstruction from a remote silent DVT. So here we, we're doing, uh, we're dilating the stent. It looks pretty good. So Windsor, I think we've got time for you to, 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 to do a completion run at, or a completion IVIS, but probably not both, uh -huh. before we go to the next room. Right. So well, let's do a, uh, let's so do a, let's, it's your choice. Let's do a completion IVIS, because that, Excellent. Is, that would oh, show you. us a lot of things. Let's just dilate there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Dr. Ting, while that's getting set up, uh, it's a beautifully deployed stent. How do you make sure that the that your access point, the common femoral vein, doesn't have disease in it if you are puncturing there? It's sometimes a bit of a, a pitfall. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, so in, it depends a lot on the severity of the disease and where I think the disease is. If, if the patient had just moderate symptoms, um, I, 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 I'm not all that keen on putting a stent in the common femoral vein because that may have some impact on, on, on the patient in a, on a long-term basis. However, if you have a patient that have very severe symptoms from chronic DVT, uh, in that particular patient, uh, I will probably access through a femoral vein uh, because I think if I find the stenosis uh, in the common femoral vein and stent that common femoral vein, that patient will, will likely improve. Windsor, any um, intraprocedural anticoagulation you're, 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 you're using for this case? Do you have a, a, a routine for these cases yeah. where it's, so it's not clear they have a DVT? Uh, intraoperatively, we just give these patients 3,000 units of heparin. So these are very fast cases. We, 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 we can finish them in a very short period of time. What do we do after, after surgery? That answer is really not, not, not known. So what I have been doing is giving this patient a factor 10A inhibitor uh, in a DVT prophylaxis dosage for anywhere from one to three to six months, depending on the underlying uh, findings uh, during the surgery. If I find that the patient has a lot of thrombus uh, or O score in the um, in the uh, iliac veins, I may put that patient on three to six months of low-level factor 10A inhibitor, such as Zeralto. Do you, do, you, do you think there's a role for antiplatelet therapy for these cases? Uh, I don't know the answer. So what I do is after I stop the, uh, the factor 10A inhibitor, I will transition this patient to baby aspirin, 81 milligram, mm -hmm. on a long-term basis. So here it is, you can see the, uh, the IVIS catheter, uh, and then you can see the, the stent looks pretty well -ended. So I think we lost your audio, but we can see the IVIS image, which actually looks phenomenal. It looks great. Yeah. Okay, we That looks excellent. Windsor, thank you so much. That was a really a, a fantastic demonstration of stent treatment for venous compression syndrome. Great case. Thank you.